first reading is from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bear, bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all what that we had did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Said to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong that they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept and went. They spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I am in the place of God. Even though you intend to harm me, God intended is good in order to preserve the number numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide you and your little ones. In this way, he reassures them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. 
Today is from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before your own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, Eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will be accountable to God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckon reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and then went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Then his fellow slaves saw what had happened. They were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from the heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are brought back this week into the discussion about forgiveness. This is a continuation of last week's gospel lesson, as you hear Peter uh, quoting the beginning, uh, uh, how Jesus began in, that, uh, in last week's reading. Jesus started by saying, if a member of the church 
offends you, then go to that one privately and talk to them. And so now you hear Peter quoting that, kind of giving a follow-up question. Uh, well, Lord, if a member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Uh, and he says, seven times? Now, Peter is, is being genuine. He's not, he's not just saying, like, do I only have to do seven? He's not really negotiating in that sense. His offer of seven comes loaded with everything that word uh, seven might mean. Uh, it is the number of days in the week because those were the number of days of creation in the first account in, of creation given in Genesis. It therefore carries the weight of completeness. Should I forgive them completely is really what he's saying. So it's not like he's trying to figure out how long do I have to keep forgiving and then when, when do I get to be mean? Uh, uh, instead, uh, he's saying, is it, is it complete forgiveness? And then Jesus raises the bar even more. No, not just seven times, says Jesus, but 77 times, or could also be translated uh, 70 times seven. So should I give, com forgive completely? No, not just completely, but always. It should be the pattern of your life. And so then it's followed by, frankly, a very difficult parable if it just stood on its own. Uh, not just because uh, there's kind of a threat from God at the end, it would seem, but, but just a challenging text in many ways. But the point of it, which uh, for us, we tend to look at the point at the end, which is why, at least for me, I kind of get hung up on that, so my Father in heaven will do to you. Uh, but actually the point is, is the story itself. A slave comes to his master and says, uh, yeah, I know I owe you a lot. A lot in this case, uh, 10,000 uh, talents. Um, I don't know the exact conversion rate from talents to U.S. dollars, but this is what I can tell you. One talent is, I believe, about 20 years worth of labor. So 10,000 talents, 20 years times 10,000, that's how much that slave owed to the Lord. And then, out of kind of an, uh, it seems like then an, an absurdity, the slave begs and says, give me enough time and I will repay you. This impossible number. And even though that's absurd and it's not going to happen, the king says, you're forgiven. Your debts are forgiven. You owe me many lifetimes, but I'm going to let it go. And so the slave on his way out encounters another fellow slave who owes him 100 denarii. That's about three months of labor. And says, you need to pay me. And his, his fellow slave says the same thing that he did to, to the Lord and says, give me enough time and I will repay you. And the slave says, no, pay me now. And then he throws him in prison. And then the others hear about this and they see that, that there's a disconnect of what's going on in the slave's life. And so they report this to the king and the king says, you know, you couldn't show the same kind of mercy. And there's this implication that it was a lot less that was owed to you than what was owed to me. I was able to show you mercy and you did not in return. The flow of that is trying to make the point that as a community of forgiveness, we ought to be as disciples of Jesus, those who reflect the kind of mercy that we have received from God. And the Gospel of Matthew is very concerned that when we do not do that, we get in the way of the proclamation of the Gospel, the good news to other people. Throughout Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's demonstrated a concern about both forgiveness and mercy and justice. But in this sense, justice 
is the ability to treat others in the way that we have been treated by God, to reflect to others that kind of mercy and kindness that we have received. The other thing that this parable is underscoring is that forgiveness is not easy. Just as difficult and complicated as the, as the parable is with all the things that it brings up, that underscores then that forgiveness is not the simple practice that we often hear in our culture, which is forgive and forget. That we just say, you know, I'm sorry. They say, I'm sorry. We say you're forgiven. And then somehow reconciliation has happened. This parable is inviting us to think that reconciliation is actually much more complicated and difficult. And so that if we are to go even seven times, let alone 77 times in forgiveness, if we're to practice a life of forgiveness, it will be challenging. But the community that's to surround us is one that is living deep into this. It's the kind of community Paul is by inviting the Christians in Rome to be. To include one another despite differences. Yes, some abstain from meat, others do not. Some will continue to practice specific holidays and others will not. But why are they doing it? That's the question that Paul is asking. If it's directed to honoring the Lord, then that's the point. Let everybody do what they need to do to honor the Lord. That is a kind of reconciliation and and justice building that Paul thinks the Christian community ought to embody. It will be complicated. It will require the kind of conversation that we talked about last week to go to one another and sort through what is going on. Then there's the, uh, the story about Joseph. And if you don't know Joseph's full story, the impact of this doesn't quite hit the way it ought to. Uh, Joseph what, when he was young, was given a gift by his father, and his brothers got jealous. A beautiful coat. And they saw that their father uh, uh, showed him preference, and they decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to beat him up, we're going to take his coat, and we're going to throw him into a pit. And then later, they decided to sell him into slavery, because just beating him up and stealing his stuff was not enough. They wanted to get rid of him. They didn't quite have the heart to kill him, but They were going to get close. So Joseph gets traded among people, and he finally ends up in Egypt, and there's so much that goes on in his story. But in the end, he ends up basically being the second in command of Egypt. Through a series of dreams, he's able to warn the Egyptians that a great famine is coming, and they ought to store up as much as they can. And they do what he suggests, and they have a super abundance of food while the rest of the world is in a famine. And so countries begin to come and ask for help from Egypt, including Joseph's family. They come to Joseph. They do not recognize him. By this point, he looks so Egyptian, and he's aged so much, they don't know who he is. They ask for food. Joseph grants it and reveals who he is. His family's shocked. And then we kind of pick up on the the story here uh, where uh, it sounds like they've gotten together and they said, oh man, this is Joseph. We're going to be in a lot of trouble. He has a lot of power and he's he's going to get revenge on us. So let's, it sounds like, concoct the story that our father's dying words was that he's supposed to forgive us. And so they go to Joseph, and whether it was a made-up story or not, Joseph is all in on what their suggestion is. And he forgives them, and he says this line that is often quoted, uh, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. I highlight this story because I think it points to the complexity and the, the, the challenge that real 
practices of forgiveness and reconciliation can embody. Because too often that line from Joseph is deployed as a way to kind of get us back into simple forgiveness or even deployed as a way to try to keep people in abusive relationships. You just suffer through that because God's going to do something good to this terrible situation that you're in. I don't think that's what Joseph intended his words to be used as. I don't think well, the Bible intends us to use those words in, in uh, relaying to us what Joseph said. But it is to be aware that in the deep work of reconciliation, that God can work very new and powerful things. But what Jesus and Paul are reminding us is that real forgiveness is developing healthy boundaries with one another. There is an excellent book uh, that's called Don't Forgive Too Soon uh, that is written by, uh, uh, I think he's a Cistercian, he's a monk or a friar of some kind, and, uh, and some of his family have written books together. And uh, one of them is Don't Forgive Too Soon. And in that, uh, they kind of sum up a lot of what I think Matthew, throughout Matthew's gospel, is trying to communicate about what this kind of forgiveness looks like. And they invite us to think of forgiveness as two hands of healing. One that says, I forgive you. And the other that says, but I'm not going to let you keep doing to me what you've been doing. Because there's a sense in that, uh, and, and that, that I think very much uh, echoes what we heard last week. That there's a sense in that, that we're also seeking the healing of the person, uh, it just as I think Joseph was doing, seeking the healing of his brothers, the reconciliation of his brothers, to a healthier way of being family or community together. To say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to let you keep doing this terrible thing. And so the, the parable underscores that, that this is all about how we build community together. That we can't just go off and do whatever we want because we know that God is going to forgive us 77 times. That God is going to do what God is is, is asking us to do also that God will be all in on forgiveness. But that doesn't mean that we can then just throw that away because we got forgiven. But instead, we are to embody that. To share that with those around us. To hold everyone up in mercy and God's love. This is a parable that really comes down to everything is about loving God and loving your neighbor. In today's parable, I think Jesus is inviting us to understand that this is what it means to the church, to be a community that is inclusive and welcoming, that practices a deep kind of forgiveness that forms us to be better people forms us to be disciples of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.